Thank you, Rosie, and thanks for having me back. I, I last did this um, for a diary of the lady, um, but this time I've got an audiovisual presentation, I'm afraid. So I think this is going to be a bit more fun for me than it is for you, um, but we will see because um, let me see if this works. Daisy's been very helpful. Years of my life, year, yesterday was spent doing. There's the book available downstairs, thanks to Rubens, Lutchins and Rubenstein. Um, I have a very unscientific theory, unlike Robin, Robin's theories tonight, that um, the most important uh, things in our lives aren't choices. Um, we don't choose our family where we're born. Um, I have a theory we don't actually choose our friends, but that's for another time. And you particularly don't choose the books you write. And this book was one that really chose me because in fact, after I did Shire Hell, I was supposed to do a book following on from uh, Nancy Mitford's last book, which is why it's very nice to see Christmas pudding on the tables. Um, anyway, I sort of started reading my, I became a total Mitfordologist, but became snagged on one thing, which was not just unity, the fact that she was in Munich, uh, in the 30s and was stalking Hitler and all the rest of it. But just as a, in the process of my research, I discovered that all roads led unter, ober, by, and zu, and von Munich. And so now I'm afraid we're going to have to start the slideshow. Um, I discovered that my mother-in-law, sitting there between my three children, was sent to Munich age 17 in 1938 and watched Hitler's tanks trundle past her finishing school on the way to annex Austria. I discovered that my great-grandmother, Helen Tracy Lowe, met my great-grandfather in Bavaria in, two, in 1906. They fell in love during strawberry walks. There is my grandfather fly fishing somewhere in Bavaria. Um, they got married, moved to Oxford, where she became the translator of Thomas Mann's works for Knopf. And when you pick up an edition of Buddenbrook's Magic Mountain, Death in Venice, you are reading my great-grandmother's words, which I'm very proud of. There they are together. I, somewhere like Bea Ritz, doesn't it, doesn't it look like? They had produced three girls, Prudence, Beatrice and Patsy. Beatrice, my grandmother, is in the middle. There she is in a portrait done by Henry Lamb. Aged, I think, it's quite difficult to work it out because she never spoke about this, but when she was a teenager, or in her early 20s, she went out to Munich, fell in love with a ski instructor slash medical student, who was, uh, as you, everyone had to be then, you know, to give a bit of context, 97% of teachers were members of the Nazi party because you had to be if you wanted to continue your profession. She fell in love with, as it were, a Nazi ski instructor and never really spoke of this again, although I did know that some fairly dark things went on during her time in Munich in the 30s. It seemed to me pretty extraordinary that my mother-in-law and my grandmother were both in Munich in the 30s. Then, of course, who do you think you are discovered that my grandmother on the other side of my family, who we always thought was French and who had been born in the Pavillon du Barry in Versailles and made us eat crisps with a knife and fork, and whose family name was de Pfeffel, was turned out to be von Pfeffel. So, as I say, all roads led to Munich, and it seemed to me that this was the book I had to write. This is my great-grandfather when he'd left Oxford, where he was professor, and moved to Princeton, where he became friends with Einstein, and, correspond and went on these long walks with Einstein in the 30s, in the sort of as the storm clouds of war were gathering. And I found letters written by my great-grandfather in the Corpus Christi archive, where he was professor, describing Einstein's views about the coming war, and in which Einstein said things like, according to my great-grandfather, my great um, that Germany, 
that he was very worried about what was going to go on in terms of, obviously, in Europe. He said, um, it's not so much the Jews. The Jews are used to persecution. The Ger it is the German race that will be you know, punished forever by what is going to happen. So yeah, all this fascinating stuff to me anyway. So as I say, all this very fascinating to me because I, always, I have to accept that other people's families are never quite as fascinating as one's own. So I know that uh, you know, genealogy is death stupefying, but I happen to find all this quite gripping. Anyway, I then thought, this is my book. And I went out to Germany, and I promise you, this is what people look like in Bavaria. <laughs> um, not only did I go around Oberammergau, Garmisch Partenkirchen, which was the site of the Winter Games, because I had this idea that the, ninth, the 1936 Winter Olympics were going to be one of the main scenes in my novel. Um, Munich, Dachau I visited, beer cellars, eating all sorts of sausages, you can't imagine. I went to the Osteria Italiana, where, of course, as you all know, Unity Mitford would sit every day with taking along a girlfriend in the hope that Hitler would come and notice her, and of course he did. And then they became firm friends, and she became the sort of epicenter of the, the English colony of girls in Munich, who Hitler was very delighted by and invited them all to, you know, state occasions like laying the foundation stone of the House of German Art, or to the rallies, or to just, you know, gave them tickets to the opera, and gave them ringside seats at rallies and so on. There is me, a hideous picture of me, um, in somewhere called Bobbing, which is a private joke. Um, as I call all my boyfriends and now my husband, Bobby. So I, my, my current Bobby took this picture of me in bobbing. Now, here we are, Daisy. Let's see if this works. Now, don't play it yet. This, not only did I go around Germany researching the country and realizing that, in fact, it's rather nice and the English should actually spend more time in Bavaria, um, I thought I needed to speak not just to my mother-in-law, my mother but to lots of the women, or to any of the women who were in Germany at the time. And at this point, my book, which had taken by this stage a year, took another additional year because I became obsessed with going around and recording. In fact, first of all, I went with a notebook. Then I realized what I was hearing was radio gold. So I went first with a notebook, then I went with a tape recorder. Then the BBC said the tape recordings I had made weren't good enough to play on the radio. So I had, then had to go back with a radio producer. So these very, very obliging women, mostly in their 90s, um, I got to know them very well. And so, of course, I was completely in love with my subject by then. Bad luck, everybody. So, Daisy, let's try and play. Ma this is Margaret Budd. It was fairyland, Hold on, can Germany. You just stop one everybody had a purpose. There was a wonderful organization for the girls called the Bund Deutscher Mädel. There was a wonderful organization for young boys before they joined the SA or the SS. And he gave the Germans back their soul. The point about that clip is that Margaret Budd, who sadly died last year, um, was a nurse in the Red Cross in the Second World War. But she, nothing that she saw after 1939 can contaminate the purity of her memory of the happiness that she felt in Germany uh, between 36 and 38 to her. In fact, to all the women I spoke to said that being in Germany then was a highlight of their lives. Skiing in the morning, opera in the evening, heady wine, you know, the whole thing was an absolute romance from start to finish. There we have Unity Mitford and obviously the Mitfords. She was very, very important in the group. All the Debs I spoke to had had some interaction with Unity. Uh, my mother-in-law, you know, Lady Reedsdale, was longing for Unity to come home, but she refused to come home. Unity, a lot of them said that, that Unity was very friendly, shared her goodies around, which meant that she introduced the English girls to the uh, stormtroopers. Um, there they are, all sort of having a lovely time. This one is, I'm not going to play the whole of this clip, but this was the story of one woman called Betty Lawson, who, you can't really hear it very well, but 
we might fade out, who went and had dinner, was dragged along to a dinner in a beer cellar, and just have a listen of this. She then one day took me to, to supper, and I remember this beer cellar, and she said uh, that he'd asked her to come and have dinner and bring another girl. And so I went. And this, isn't it funny how things stand out in your mind? I thought, what an awful, squalid little place to take a girlfriend and her friend to supper, you know, in this sort of back street of uh, Munich and down the steps and rather dark and sort of like a sort of, it's like a pub, really, you know, the sort of mugs and things. It was there. a beer cellar. It was a beer cellar, yeah, exactly. I and remember. Not, I remember thinking they don't have nice glasses. They were sort of mug things we drank <laughs> out of. And that was the first time I'd seen him. He was sitting there with another man who had very high cheekbones. But I think it must have been Hess. So you had dinner, our cut, yes. with Unity Mitford. That, and Rudolf Hess. And Adolf Hitler. That's right. What did you talk about? Well, it's terribly difficult, you know, they, they talked about, asked us what we were doing, you know, and uh, what galleries and what operas, and uh, one of them, and I can't remember, I think it was, it, it must have been Hitler, he'd never been to England, had he? So it must have been him, and he was terribly interested, that's the part I remember. The reason he took an interest in me, he knew that I was the stepdaughter of a royal courtier. Um, yeah. You hear my voice because I ended up doing a radio documentary about the English colony in Munich. Um, as I say, they have owned, the women I spoke to was like playing an uncorrupted file on a CD. Let's have this one. <laughs> There was another English girl in the family where I was staying who was older than me and she had a car. Margaret Budd also has fond memories of the period, the place, even the songs, a fondness that can seem slightly disturbing to us from a perspective of 70 odd years. And so we were able to go to places like Berchtesgaden and sit. I wish I could find the photograph of her and me sitting with our Tyrolean hats on the road to Berchtesgaden and looking up at, at Obersalzburg at Hitler's house yes, with the swastika flag. Right, we've got to really, really move on. But um, just quickly, one of them, Margaret Budd, did sing me this song, and I think you'll all recognize what this is. Die Fahne hoch, die Reihen festgeschlossen, es sah marschiert mit mutig festem Schritt. Kameraden, die Rotfront und Reaktion schossen, marschieren im Geist in unser Reihen mit. I was quite proud to get the Horst Bessel song played on Radio 4. Um, but that was sung by an, a woman in her 90s in her Chelsea drawing room. So, you know, extraordinary. I felt a you know, wonderful subject for a novel. Um, now, this is another lady who's actually here tonight, who's kindly come to hear this, and um, Prilly Crowther, who was one of the women who spoke to me repeatedly. Um, and let's hear what Prilly has. There's no audio. No audio. Try the next one. This is somebody who um, Prilly was friends with in, in Munich uh, when she was at a boarding school called Marquetstein. And I was going through Prilly's album and I said, he's nice, what happened to him? And I'm afraid Prilly said that all the boys she, she met in Germany were lovely. And, but all of them It was died. very tragic because I think nearly all of the boys were killed in the war. They were just the wrong age, you see, and most of them died on the Russian front. I know I, I can't, let's not play that. I can't even think what it is. Um, well, it, the fact that Hitler was absolutely enthralled by all these German, these English girls in, in, around him in Germany. And um, I know that what all of you want to know is, and I, the, the question that the Sun newspaper has asked me to write about, which is, what did the English girls actually get up to? And I think we know the coded 
um, intent of that question. Uh, Anne de Corsi interviewed many more of them than I did for her book, Debs at War. And she says that of the 50 or 47 she interviewed, only two of them knew the facts of life when they were by the age of 19. However, David Price Jones, Unity's biographer, said, quoted to me, I'm afraid the Debs were all shagging the Nazis. And um, they found the Nazis terribly sexy. The red leather seats of the black shiny Mercedes and the black, high black leather boots. I did open book about this yesterday with Mariella. I only got one more thing to say. And uh, as a result of that, I got an email from a woman today saying, um, dear Rachel, you don't know me, but I've been working on an amazing stash of diaries from an English Deb who visited Dresden frequently in the 1930s and spent her days learning German and going skiing, and much of her time having sex. I wondered if your old ladies told you if they slept with their German admirers. These diaries I've been given are amazingly frank. Sex in the kitchen, in the living room, from the front, from the back, how many times, etc., etc. And I wondered if your interviewees were similarly busy or similarly frank. Also, my author fell in love with a Jew, which complicated matters, whereas it sounded as though your ladies were more involved with good Aryans. All I will say is if you want to know, I'm afraid you will have to read Winter Games. Thank you very much. Thank you.